Good morning, everybody. This is Omar Serrato with the Tilted Lawyer Podcast, joined after a very long hiatus by Ileana Clone Rosa. We are here to discuss episodes one and two of the Natalia Grace Barnett documentary that's currently playing on HBO Max that was released earlier this month. Um, among the issues, we're going to go over some of the medical evidence that suggests that she's actually a 20 year old girl in the year of our lord 2024 we're going to talk about what's going on with the mans we're going to discuss that initial face-off between natalia and michael as they set it up and we're going to talk about lots of other things as we get started so you're going to stick around let's do this whatever you might be going through and wherever you might be this is omar serrano with the tilted lawyer podcast I'm here to take your mind off of things. Yes, I'm an attorney. No, I'm not giving you legal advice. We're going to sit and talk like people as these are the candid thoughts of one practicing attorney and it's after hours. So have a seat. Feel free to have a drink and join me. Let's get started. And we are back. So episode one of the Natalia Grace Barnett episode titled Age, Rage, and the Big Lie. What was the big lie? Well, there was lots of them. Um, Ileana, how are you? I'm doing good. I'm alive. Sick and dying <laughs> over there uh, remotely from your home yes. um, in the care of a four-month-old baby. Um, yes. So you weren't here for the last episode, but we gave just kind of a summary a synopsis of the bombshell developments that came out throughout the whole um, my, it was my summary of episodes one through six. Um, and we're going okay. to today, as you know, now we're going to deep dive in episodes one and two and just talk about it. Now, you have a unique perspective on this because you, I have performed exactly one adoption in my legal career. You um, <laughs> have this as more of a regular practice. And you had some thoughts about the Manzes, um, the Barnetts and this whole process. And we're going to talk about it. So episode one, as you recall, it opens up with this ridiculous 90s style talk show, Jerry Springer interlude um, that included um, one of the most hilarious scenes of the entire documentary is the one where um, in season one where Michael was throwing a tantrum, throwing a fit and he was like falling on the floor and he was pounding on the ground and he hit the ground like as hard as he could a couple of times and then he's like ow my hand and he hurt himself um it makes me laugh every time i saw it but they begin with this and you know the dramatic effect and we're gearing mm -hmm. up for the big start um they highlight the date of april 4th 2023 the video pans over to natalia grace as she walks in and she sits in her wheelchair and then like it's game time she slaps her knee and it's 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 ready to go um, and in the midst of all of that, she says that I want you to know how old I am because I want to know too, at that point on April 4th, it wasn't abundantly clear to her how actually old she was, which, um, think about that. Think about that. Um, I was talking to my wife yesterday about that specifically. And, you know, cause she asked like, how could you just not know how old you are? And I was like, well, I mean, you have an idea. I mean, think about it. Yeah. Every think back to your earliest memories when you were one, two, three, four, if you can remember that far back. My earliest memory um, is of my first birthday. I vividly remember sitting in my grandmother's house, sitting on my mother's lap. She was trying to get me to write my name in cursive and there was like a big, or not a big, it was like a small white frosted cake with one of those wax number ones. Um, and then they sung happy birthday. That's the earliest memory. That's as far back as I could go. Um, I don't really have much of a memory of, of uh, age two, except the times that was variously uh, playing in my grandmother's house. Age three, I can remember because of Ghostbusters. Age four, I remember because my fourth birthday party, there was a Smurfs cake. And it was this uh, backyard birthday party at my paternal grandmother's house. Um, but every memory that I have is time stamped in my head because of some significant time marker. Natalia... Her thoughts and her memories have been skewed due to the severe trauma that she's endured. And let alone, you know, when she was a very young girl, six, seven, eight, nine, when she was with the Barnetts, they were consistently convincing her, telling her that you're going to tell people that you're 22 years old. And so here she is. Here she is. If she was born in 2003 
sitting in this wheelchair, prepared to tell her side of the story. She's been questioning it just like everybody else is questioning it. She thinks she knows how old she is. She has confidence that she knows how old she is. And that's based on her firm belief in the, the events that she knows in her life. And the Barnetts are saying, no, actually, she's uh, 33 years old because she was born in 1989. So this is her first opportunity to kind of talk about that. Um mm -hmm. She says that there's a lot of things that she can remember. She can't picture it. She wants the puzzle to be complete. Um, she says unequivocally that the Barnetts are lying about her age. Um, she blatantly says that this, that this re-aging process was prompted because of the movie The Orphan. And then we've talked about that ad nauseum. And the summary that we did and back in the, the, the other two episodes that we did for season one about six months back. Um, she talked about how the Barnett's accused her of eating her period. And there was a lot of comments about how that was or how that was even possible. Um, and that was a story that came about in a deposition from Michael Barnett, where he basically said that the way that she was hiding her age was by and specifically her menstrual cycle was by eating the remnants of her period so that she wouldn't have to have a, a, a pad or a tampon or whatever, or any evidence. Um, she talks about the Barnetts accusing them of trying to murder the family. She talks about her being uh, dropped off in that apartment in Tippecanoe County and Lafayette County. Mm -hmm. And she ends with the bombshell that Christine basically tried to murder me. Um, and we know, mm -hmm. having watched the series, what she's specifically talking about is the attempt by Christine to overdose um, young Natalia while she was staying at yeah. there in the apartment um, on a medication that she was prescribed um, by one of her doctors. Um, introduction to Bishop Antoine Manns. Before I talk about it, what just from your guts, Eliana, is your opinion about this gentleman? When he came into the, um, the documentary here in season one, this is our first introduction. And it's actually not our first introduction. We saw him back on the Dr. Phil show um, about a year ago, two years ago, maybe. Um, and he made his television debut with Natalia then. Um, but what do you think about this guy, Antoine Mans? There's been a lot of comments from our listeners that, well, he's not, he, he, he's kind of fishy. What do you think about him? Yeah, same thing. He's kind of fishy. I mean, I don't remember much about him from the first uh, documentary. I remember more about her her for some reason he wasn't um, in the first documentary the, i don't believe he wasn't okay that's fine what i believe I, that I we covered was um his appearance on the dr phil show with natalia oh, okay where they talk about yes. um some of the reaging stuff um that's where we got our introduction and we don't really know a whole lot about him other than he's an adoptive parent he happens to be a bishop in the church that kind of led us into our introduction to Cynthia Manns, who explained that she mm -hmm. loves being a mom she has 11 children most of those are adopted children um, and she says that when Natalia came to our family, she was broken. And we've been trying to pick up the pieces for what Michael and Christine did to her. And they, they basically positioned themselves in this documentary as the, the, uh, her guardian angel. And they were coming to rescue her and give her the childhood that she never had. Um, and they talk about Natalia being with the mans for 10 years. And this was basically after the uh, Lafayette apartment um, when mm -hmm. they were finally able to take her in. So she's been with the barn with, with the man's since 2013. Um, and then as we know, um, spoiler alert on episode six, they kind of had a falling out. And um, I had some thoughts mm -hmm. about that. Um, but let me reserve that be uh, so we could get through this show. Um, they introduced Beth Karras. She's the resident legal analyst uh, for this documentary and, I'm really not sure what her involvement all in any of this was. I don't think she had any official involvement in the litigation. She was just kind of brought in there to uh, talk about uh, the case yeah. from her perspective. Um, and she basically said that uh, Natalia was reloaded to Tip Canoe and they, uh, as a result of the re-aging. And she talks about the Adult Learning Center and her, Natalia, getting the attention of the staff because it was a little fishy. She's saying she's 22 mm -hmm. years old, but this is clearly a child. And then they call the uh, sheriff department. That's how they get involved. Introduction mm -hmm. to Bob Goldsmith, who was the first detective involved in the case. And that was back in September 2014. He receives a, a phone call from the Excel Center saying that they had a little girl 
that had come in and things just were not adding up. She had an ID, an Indian ID that says she's like 22 or 25. Uh, but the conversations that she has, she might be 11 years old. And this is going back in 2014. Um, mm -hmm. Her birth certificate from the Ukraine says that she was born in 2003. So they're spot on if that's what they, they, they guessed. Um, and he says that, you know, I've been around a lot of special needs people, um, but there was nobody like Natalia. And I think, you know, you, when you talk about special needs children, you know, and, and what he's normally probably accustomed to is, you know, children with autism, children with special needs, uh, learning deficits, mm -hmm. mental de de deficits. Um, that wasn't Natalia. Her specific deficit was physical. She just had a, a form of dwarfism that required extensive medical attention, required surgeries and a lot of other stuff. Um, he said, uh, that I asked her if she thought that she was 25 and she said no. So when he gets involved, mind you, this was in 2014, this would have been after, um, Beth had instructed Natalia to start saying that you're 22 years old. He asked her, just, he just said, Hey, so do you think you're, do you think that you're 25? She says no. And he says at one point I had asked Natalia if she had been abused. She froze up on me, and I wasn't going to pry. Um, and knowing what I know, he said and explained that I don't think, um, you know, she was, he, he's basically intimating that she was exhibiting symptoms of experiencing abuse and the trauma that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to get involved with that. Um, but then he just unequivocally says, I don't think the justice has been served here. They bring in Detective Travis Dow, and remember they have this whole conversation. Um, and Travis says that he remembers getting into the car, um, and then we both have children. He said, there's no way that that child is 22 years old. Um, and then they, they ask the question, do you think it was an act? Um, and then he says, well, in all the interactions that we've ever had, you know, watching her in the lobby, um, she's always acted like a little child. And if she was acting, she never once, ever, ever, broke character. So they're, they're just talking, just kind of mm -hmm. shooting the breeze, um, with these people. Fast forward to court deposition of Michael Barnett in March 20th of uh, last year, 23. They asked him point blank, how old do you think Natalia was? And then he said, no clue. Uh, did you think that she was a child? And he said, no, because Natalia had been telling everybody that she was a grown up. And there was ample evidence uh, that that family, specifically the Barnetts, had been instructing Natalia to tell everybody that she's 22. And so, look, 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 there's a lot of credibility issues with all of the parties involved. And I think you could include Natalia in all of that. Um, and I appreciated one of the comments from one of our listeners. Um, and this is what they had to say. Oh, did I just lose it? I just lost it. Let me find it again. Yeah, so one of our listeners, one of our listener comments says that I'm an adoptive parent. Uh, the person who wrote this comment was everyone has an opinion with five zeros in, at the end of it. And they say that I'm an adoptive parent of more than one child diagnosed with reactive attachment disorder. <clears throat> if you recall, back in episode six, they specifically made reference in passing that Natalia um, may have that disorder. Um, and she, this, the comment goes on to read, I'm not defending the Barnetts. I don't know them. What I do know is that children with RAD, through no fault of their own, can absolutely demolish a family from top to bottom. They are so charming to those outside the home. They know how to ingratiate themselves to everyone at school, church, extended family, etc. The adoptive mother tends to be their first target for destruction, and the adoptive mom ends up looking like a horrible person. Kids with RAD tell fantastical lies and will die on a hill convincing others they are they are truths. Marriages are ruined often by adoptees with RAD as they will accuse fathers of sexual assault or mothers of physical abuse and the parents turn and devour each other. There is no way to know if Natalia was really pepper sprayed, made to eat her menstruation or any of these stories. Ukraine specifically has so many children with fetal alcohol effect on top of getting generally awful care in the orphanage, have altered brain chemistry. Let's not be too quick to believe everything or anything this child has said. Um, I have no doubt her family was in hell trying to parent her, and I know firsthand. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to say this from the very top. Um, Natalia and her behavior is not at issue because I'm just going to go out on a limb 
and say that an adopted child that grew up in the Ukraine who had her childhood stolen from her because she was re-aged by what was supposed to be the loving, caring, rescuing adoptive parents that the Barnetts were supposed to be, after having been ripped from a couple of other families, one of them given away, the Chaconis, and then there was this other adoptive family that was going to take her in that had a similar physical condition to her, and that was stopped by the Chaconis because they thought that this new adoptive family had filed a CPS report against them. That was uh, stopped, mm-hmm. and so that's how they ended up with the Barnetts. Um, she was re-aged. She was left by herself as a child and all of these different things. I'm just going to go out on a limb and assume that Natalia Grace probably has behavioral issues. And I'll even go in as far as to concede that she has severe behavioral issues. I'll even go so far as to say that she probably did a lot of the stuff that the third hand accounts say that she did in terms of being sexually inappropriate, saying sexual things, cursing, saying, I hate you, uh, making verbal threats, that kind of stuff. I'm going to concede that all of those things are probably true. And I'm also going to concede based on what I watched Natalia say in this documentary when they were asking her specific questions that she may have been embellishing a lot of it. I'm even going to go out and say that she might be denying a lot of the negative stuff, the negative allegations that were brought against her because she's ashamed of some of the things. I will grant you that she has behavioral issues. I have no doubts that it was a challenge for the Barnetts to raise her. I have no doubts that she had issues with her siblings or probably schoolmates. I have no doubts that she made um, inappropriate comments to people when she was in the mental health facility. And I have no doubts that the mans in the 10 years in watching her had issues with her as they were raising her. But we're not here to talk about that. She's not the one on trial here. The specific allegations, the specific legal litigation that remains to be litigated in my eyes appropriately is whether or not she was fraudulently re-aged by the Barnetts, which episode one kind of gets into the whole scheme of that. And before I get too far into that, not only that, it's if we can prove that she was fraudulently re-aged, meaning the Barnetts specifically and... um, intentionally misled the courts by not giving them the best information and only giving them the information she wanted to hear that would allow even a competent judge. And I don't believe that the judge that re-aged her was competent by any means. I think there was a number of different objections that could have and should have been raised that, but were weren't that, that were not raised. Um, if they, if she was fraudulently re-aged because the Barnett's perpetrated this event, then I think that there should be culpability in a criminal case because of a lot of things that we had talked about. We talked about raised judicata. We talked about double jeopardy. I'm not sure if that's going to work out in the criminal courts, but certainly in the civil case, I think where we're going with that is the Barnetts fraudulently and intentionally misled the courts to allow them to believe that she was re-aged or that she was actually 22 years old. Why would they do such a thing? Mm -hmm. Because Natalia was costing them a severe amount of money. Because Natalia didn't end up being the genius that Christine hoped she was going to be. It wasn't meshing with the image that she was trying to perpetrate as she was writing this book, The Spark, with her child, Jacob, Mm -hmm. who was diagnosed as a a genius or whatnot. And um, therefore, they wanted to get rid of her. What's the easiest way to do that? Well, re-age her as an adult. And even that was stupid because... The fact that she was disabled, she was still on the hook with all of them until the mans came in to kind of take over. But if you could prove all of those things, and I think that you can, based on what I've seen, um, then civil liability as to child neglect, yes. Civil liability as to uh, child abuse, yeah. I don't know if we have enough to corroborate claims of sexual assault because Natalia hasn't even really brought those claims. Um, But there is certainly some civil culpability that the Barnetts are um, looking at. And Michael, in all of this, he's basically came into this whole thing is, you know what? This is my strategy. This is what I'm going to do. It was all Christine's fault. She's responsible for all of it. And but for um, us being the victim of this evil monster, Christine, um, 
Natalia would have lived peacefully ever after with us as we aged her and rode off into the sunset or whatever. That's his whole deal from what I'm seeing. Um, what are your thoughts on all of that, Eliana? Oh, that's a lot uh, on which part. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Well, I mean, the, the civil liability part, certainly. And well, not to put well, you on the spot, I, I, but, you know, I just wonder if you had no, any specific I, uh, thoughts. I agree with you as far as the things that uh, I think that should be able to prove the sexual abuse part. I don't think uh, that Natalia has talked enough about it or maybe provided enough evidence to prove that. But the others allegations, yes, definitely, especially with all of the uh, evidence that was uh, presented in the documentary about the uh, the Barnett's like they yeah. knew they they had the proof they just decided to so let's uh, get into that right hide it right <laughs> yeah. because they go they go in and they jump in and they say that this was a closed adoption and um mm -hmm. you know closed adoption meaning there was only one agency um mm -hmm. and he said this in under oath under under um, multiple um depositions now the people that volunteered information beth Karras, who wasn't really involved in the litigation but they certainly brought in the detectives they brought in an fbi agent to talk about a little bit which is interesting i'm wondering what why the fbi was getting involved at all um yeah if it became a federal case because of them jumping state lines maybe when they went to canada that brought it maybe into the federal purview um but let's talk about that so 2010 michael claims that this was a closed adoption that he was not told where Natalia was from, that he was advised to check her luggage by people that were working at the adoption facility and look for clues. And that was going to let him know that, oh, she's from the Ukraine. Um, and when he did that, he says that that's how he learned of the original family's information. The original family, I guess, I'm assuming that that meant uh, her biological parents um, or the Chaconis. But he claims that he never met the Chaconis. And I'm not sure what oh, to make of that statement. Remember. Mm -hmm. because Natalia says, no, 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 I specifically remember them meeting in a room and they all met. There's emails between them going back and forth. So he certainly interacted with them. So the fact that he says they never met is a lie, but why would he lie about such a thing? And that's what this documentary was kind of going into. Now, Natalia says this, she says that everybody met at the adoption agency and claims to remember the Chaconis and the Barnett's talking specifically. Um, she said that when the Chaconis took me to the agency, I remember being told to sit outside the room and wait. The Chaconis go inside first, and they talk to Michael and Christine and the three boys. I remember waiting for a while. Finally, the Chaconis came out and said I could come in. I remember going up to Michael and giving him a hug. Um, and then she was crying because there was still a lot of confusion. Um, you know, she'd spent a couple of years with the Chaconis at least. Um, got to know her adopted siblings and, you know, was starting to attach herself to the Chaconis as this, these are my parents. And this is what I mean. Um, that specific disorder, which basically that we had referenced, RAD, that it, it basically stands for the proposition that this child um, has severe uh, deficiencies when it comes to forming bonds with people. Why? Because they don't know if the next person coming out that purports to be mom and dad are going to stick around. And so mm -hmm. this girl was given up on the day that she was born by her bi biological mother. She spends time with this Ukrainian orphanage. Um, she's paraded around um, in front of all of these prospective adoptive families. She's taken in by the Chaconis um, and spends time with them and spends a couple of years with them. Um, and she talks about what that was like for her. But before I go into that, um, Beth Karras had explained um, in the documentary that what a closed adoption, what does that even mean? It means uh, that there is no information about or contact with the prior family. So when you have a closed mm -hmm. adoption, you're just taking the kid. There's no communication, no contact, no information exchanged between the uh, former parents, whether that be biological or the, uh, the, the, the latest parents, the, the, the old adoptive parents, and the new adoptive parents. You're just blindly going in and you're taking in this child. Why would Michael tell that story? And they go over, um, well, Beth says, well, first of all, we know it wasn't a closed adoption because number one, there's Natalia's account. She was in the room when they specifically mm -hmm. met. But even if you don't believe Natalia, 
maybe she has a shoddy memory or, or whatever, fine. But there was email exchanges um, that included the executive director of adoption by Shepherd's Care. They were talking to both of the families. And so there's two separate adoption agencies that are involved. Um, there were also signed contracts between the two that had the names. Um, the Chaconis and the Barnett, they were involved in legal proceedings. And what uh, specifically that means is the adoption proceedings um, because there were complications. And Michael hides this fact. He hides this fact specifically when they go into the re-aging process with, um, well, when they try to get her re-aged. Why? Because in those adoptive papers, there was specifically information from medical examinations that aged her that seemed to suggest that she was, you know, between six and eight years old at the time of the adoption. He was given that information. He had that information. Um, he's claiming not that, oh, I never, I never knew. Um, and so he led everybody to believe that adoption by Shepherd's Care was the sole adoption agency brokering the adoption. It just wasn't true because Gateway Woods was significantly involved. And Gateway Woods would have been the ones that specifically gave him the medical information specifically related to Natalia's age and, of course, other stuff. Um, but this whole thing about he never met the Chaconis, he's still lying about that, by the way, because in that face-off, in face-off number two back in episode six, he goes on to say that, well, um, I, I never met them. You're remembering it incorrectly. Uh, but that doesn't change mm -hmm. the fact that there's documents to suggest otherwise. So you have... Um, well, you practice more in the adoption arena than I do. So maybe you could shed some insight as to um, when you're going through this adoptive process. Like, what, is, what are these proceedings like when it's not a closed adoption, for example? Um, what's the process? What's involved? Well, the kind of adoptions that I've done um, are more uh, with children that are, like, I guess, within family, like a cousin, a yeah, uh, I did one of those. Yeah, I think, yeah, so you already have some information about the child, but, but from what I've learned um, in the process, but I haven't done one of these yet, is that when you're uh, choosing a child to adopt that you don't know, um, if you do a close adoption, um, the information that I know is that you don't get like a lot, you don't get contact uh yeah. with the previous family you don't know a lot of the information um but i'm not sure about the medical records like even you know now that i'm thinking about it i don't know if you actually get medical records when it's a close adoption i would suggest i i would think that maybe but in an open adoption you would you would readily have those records correct oh yes yes yeah. which is the point so michael's claiming michael is claiming it's a closed adoption um, mm -hmm. But everybody's saying, no, no, BS with that. It was open. You had all of this information. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like you're going in this not knowing anything. You knew what you were getting into, yeah. right? You so, didn't like it. <laughs> it. It's fishy. And so, like you just stated, you're, you're going into an open adoption, and most of the adoptions that mm -hmm. you do are open. Um, I just did an open ad adoption. I, I consulted with you. It's like, hey, so um, mm -hmm. how does this go? Um, but yeah, you, you have, you're privy to that information. You can't just make a claim. So the reason why he's trying to claim, the reason why he's trying to claim this was a closed adoption is because it opens him up to liability. And why is he trying to hide anything? All of this goes back to liability. He's very well versed in what he needs to say by his attorney. And we're going to mm -hmm. talk about that oh, guy. Yeah. Nobody likes that guy, <laughs> but he's a really good attorney. He said, hey, you're going to want to make sure you don't admit or say anything that you knew this, this, or that, right? You're going to say those things. Mm -hmm. So everything that Michael has, in episodes one through six, everything that he ever came out of his mouth was geared specifically towards placing all of the blame on Christine and making sure that it was understood that he knew nothing of Natalia's real age, her real medical condition, her uh, all this stuff, and so plausible deniability, right? That's what he's going for. Yes. Um, and we're going to get to that. Let's talk about when Natalia uh, goes into the homes with the Chaconis. She's adopted by them. This would have been back in 2008. And this, you know, 
you're if you're watching the documentary, it kind of puts a smile on your face. She's adopted, and she would have been about four or five years old at the time. And if you could put yourself in her shoes, she pulls up into this big driveway, um, and she says, my five-year-old self being so excited because it was this big house, and how much bigger would it have appeared uh, to her? Um, mm -hmm. My daughter thinks that I'm a giant, and I'm just, you know, I'm a regular size guy. <laughs> But because I'm the tallest person in my house, I'm a giant. But, you know, just the eyes, the perception, the physical perception of children. So here she is. She's five. She gets to this house. She says, I just remember looking everywhere. They opened the door and through the door was my bedroom. It was pink. I was so excited and every, that to be there and because they had everything there. Um, and she said that I was with them for about two years. There's a lot of good memories that she had. And after a while, something changed. She explains. Mm -hmm. Um, one time me and the little boy were playing, I had landed on his arm wrong and I just kept saying, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you. Gary came in, Gary Ciccone and started yelling. I was crying. I was mad. I said, I hate you. She probably said a lot of other stuff. Um, mm -hmm. and then after that, it's like, Gary didn't like me anymore. And I felt like yeah. he hated me. Then one day I remember Diane coming in my room and she told me, I'm not going to be your mom anymore, but I'll always love you. Um, and she says that I just felt like I was abandoned most of the time. Um, and then enter uh, Diane uh, or Beth Karras. She comes in to chime in and says, well, Diane Ciccone, um, she had gone to the little people of America. This was after the incident with the siblings and said that this little girl's available for adoption. She met a bunch of families. None of them adopted her. And then they found a family who wanted her in Florida Natalia talks about Gary and Diana passing me around to families and I met a bunch, but they didn't want to adopt me or something happened. And then we go to Florida because they found a family and then they start talking about, you know, the other parts, but I, I had some comments about that. So, um, listen, children, I, I could recall very specifically, um, being in about four or five years old in preschool. And I was like in this like little tube thing with another child and we we're playing like swords or something with like sticks um or fighting and i was he-man or you know whatever we were doing and um mm -hmm. i knocked that kid down on accident we're, we're like play fighting um and i was like apologetic i didn't mean to do it and then i went to go like uh, tell the teacher or something and then she came up to me and she grabbed me by my shoulders and started shaking me like what did you do now looking back on that what, is, what does that look like? It's very specific. You can't do that yeah. at a preschool. <laughs> that was a crime. Uh, I didn't know that it for. I was just kind of shocked. Like, what am I getting in trouble for? I didn't mean to trip the guy. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't even specifically make him fall. He just kind of, he just kind of fell because he's a, you know, he's clumsy. Four. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very easy for adults when injuries occur to children to blow things out of proportion. And I'm just going to say this. Oh, yes. I have a cousin who is a successful business owner, and he currently lives in Atlanta, Georgia. And he's doing very well, and you know, he's, he's a successful person. But when I was about three or four years old, that effing guy Specifically, I was looking out the window and, and, and observing the majesty of uh, Baldwin Park, California, you know, in, the, in uh, whatever it was my, my mom could afford, my parents could afford at the time. And he pushed my face through a window. Terror screams, right? And that required that I got uh, stitches and it was my first exposure to uh, that kind of medical procedure and everybody's all freaking out about it. But it was also 1983, 84, you know, things happen with children. That same cousin, I remember very specifically, I had another cousin, Keith. We were playing with a hammer and then he took the hammer and then he just whacked my cousin in the back of the head. And thankfully, I mean, that could have been really, really bad. Um, I mean, but if you litigate that in 2024, that juvenile oh. might be charged with attempted murder. Now, thankfully, mm -hmm. um, I, that other cousin, they got bashed in the head with a hammer. And the, the guy that did both of those is responsible for both of those traumas um, grew up to be successful. But if Natalia would have done something like that, the narrative would have been, oh, see, she's a psychopath. And obviously, um, you know, she was the issue because there's some of the comments. I would say it's probably 90 
to 10 in favor of Natalia. Uh, but there's 10% is like, yeah, but she's a little psychopath and she's responsible for some of this. Look, I acknowledge, I'm fully aware that she probably had behavioral issues. I just don't care when it comes to figuring out what is the culpability of the Barnetts in all of this. Mm -hmm. That's why this documentary was created is because they placed a child, um, had her re-aged, destroying her childhood, um, stripping her of all of the rights that would have befallen a minor in the state of Indiana or in the United States for that matter, um, placed her in this apartment to fend for herself and all of these different things. And so behavioral issues, I'm sure there was with the Chaconis, I'm sure. I've never adopted a child. I've thought about adopting children, um, but uh, that has kind of been put on hold because we kind of have our hands full with the kids that we have right now. Um, and you're getting a, a, a taste of that. You have your four month old. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, it's a lot now. Imagine imagine that one plus another. It's a lot, yeah. man. Mm -hmm. So, um, where was I? Oh, so Jackie Starbuck. If you're familiar with her, I have a lot of bones to pick with Jackie. She was the lead deputy prosecutor on the state versus Barnett cases. She talks about, okay. as we were conducting this investigation and talking to witnesses, it was clear that there was something going on that was unusual. And from the time that Natalia came to the Barnetts, there continued to be a pattern of, we don't know how old Natalia was, when the fact, in fact, they had been told repeatedly by multiple medical professionals that that wasn't the case. They claimed not to have any prior medical records of her prior medical history, even though they were providing medical records to the school system prior to adopting them. So they had to enroll her in school. They had to give the school medical records and the medical records unequivocally state because they were signed by the Barnetts um, that this little girl is probably like six or seven years old. So this statement by Michael, this statement by Christine, who never appeared on the documentary. But by the way, did you know that she released a statement like yesterday or something like that or a couple days ago? I'll talk about that at yes. the end before I get thrown off track. Um, the point is um, that not only were they aware of the medical diagnoses that suggested that she was actually a child and not 22, but they submitted themselves that information to the schools where they enrolled her. And so again, what's the deal with the lies? Um, they talked about, and I'm just kind of running through the highlights of this episode one. There was the, the trip to Disney, um, Disney World. And this doesn't really mean a whole lot other than it was Natalia's account of, um, she remembers seeing the Chaconis. She remembers pointing okay. them out. Um, she's like, hey, it's mom. And Christine's like, that's not your mom anymore. I'm your mom. Um, and then we get to the hotel later that night and Christine is going to have... Um, she's giving her brand new daughter a bath. And recall, this is the scene where they discover that, hey, Natalia might have pubic hair. Um, my thought on that, if uh, Natalia kind of explained it, she says, look, six or seven years old, some people start early, some people start late. And she says that she's about six or seven years old when she started getting pubic hair. Mm -hmm. um, I just mm -hmm. don't think, and Beth Karras agrees, and Jackie Starbuck also agrees, that she just doesn't think uh, that the whole discovery that this seven-year-old girl, six-year-old girl having pubic hair was the big trigger that led them to try to re-age her. In other words, if you believe the Barnetts, this is their story. So we take her home and we think everything is great and we have this six-year-old in her house and everybody's excited. We go to Disney World and we go to give her a bath in WTF, full-on bush, pubic hair. And, um, but they didn't do anything to, they didn't start the litigation at that point. You know, they're claiming that that was like what prompted all of that. That didn't trigger anything. And, and furthermore, um, and I don't know, but I'll take Natalia's word for it. Six or seven years old. She says she's maybe seven or eight when she started. That sounds about right. It doesn't sound under the realm of possibility. Um, it makes sense. I've had people chime in on uh, the comments from our last show, basically stating mm -hmm. that, hey, the whole baby tea thing, um, puberty, a lot of people volunteered about their experience with their menstrual cycle in our comment section. I know way more oh about menstruals than I ever thought I'd ever know um, as a result of this case. Um, but furthermore, just people develop differently. Point being, exactly. this independent discovery that Natalia 
had pubic hair was not a triggering event the way that the Barnetts had claimed. So let's talk about um, Gateway Woods Apostolic Christian Children's Home. They wrote something. They wrote a document. It was titled Final Post Placement Recommendation. What was, in, what, what was included in that report? Now, why is this important? Because Gateway Woods was the initial adoption agency that was involved with the Chaconis. And not only was it Gateway Woods involved with the uh, adoption, but it was that other one that we had talked about. And Gateway Woods had supplied the Barnetts and everybody else with all of her medical records. So what was in that report? There was reports on the home visits with the Chaconis. There was reports on the home visits with the Barnetts. There was a report from Dr. Andrew Riggs, an endocrinologist specifically tasked uh, with, the, with the job of aging Natalia. And on June 3rd of 2010, when she would have been about six years old, she was determined by this doctor to be somewhere between nine and 11. Um, and the specific paragraph in that report says this, Natalia Ciccone was born on September 4th, 2003 in Ukraine, according to the records from the Ukraine. However, Dr. Dr. Andrew Riggs, an endocrinologist, evaluated Natalia on June 3rd of 2010. The tests showed she had pre-adolescent development with tanner number one of breast development and tanner number two of pubic hair. Dr. Andrew Riggs then had hormone tests of Natalia to determine if this was normal development or precocious puberty, premature puberty, if, um, mm -hmm. if you've never heard that term. The tests showed no abnormalities, and therefore Dr. Riggs estimated Natalia's age to be between 9 to 11 years old, which is still older than her birth age of 2003, if this report was generated in 2010, which is when it was dated. Um, but the parents were told this directly. Um, and then Beth Karras uh, goes on to say that her opinion was that Michael had to distance himself from this report because he was specifically told Natalia was a child. And Gateway Woods incorporated this information into uh, the divorce petition. And so by leading others to believe that the adoption was closed, Michael guaranteed that very few questions about his story would be asked about the adoption. So it's like in family law, um, you discover that the child, um, you know, uh, the father, you know, he has these children, but he has these other children, right? And you don't have anything, any information on them because it doesn't matter. So if on your re-aging petition, you only put uh, one of the adoption agencies, nobody's going to ask about Gateway Woods unless they were specifically looking for that, such as what you would do in discovery, or maybe you're subpoenaing all of the records. And I don't know, Eliana, am I crazy? But if you're going to re-age a child, wouldn't it stand to reason that that child should have representation of some kind? maybe like minors oh, council, yes. like in California we mm -hmm. would do. Because if you re-age somebody from age eight to 22, you're, mm -hmm. a, you're, you're stripping them of all of the protections that is afforded minor children, which means specifically mm -hmm. that she's going to be prejudiced for the rest of her life going forward in the event that the judge makes the wrong decision, which she was. And so mm -hmm. shouldn't she be protected in that regard so it's only one of two outcomes i i can't understand why she wasn't at the very least appointed um separate counsel that's what would have happened Minor in california counsel? yeah or at least her guardian at litem something some sort guardian of litem minors counsel yeah, she was pretty much ignored like she didn't have a, a say in her own <laughs> exactly reach like <laughs> But Due process, like. I don't know. <laughs> I went to law school same as you. Do, doesn't it stand to reason that that is a violation of her due process rights, yes. constitutional rights? And doesn't it stand to reason also that that would be by itself an appealable issue that would warrant a reexamination into all of this? Which if we were reexamining oh, yeah. it and we got the information from Gateway Woods, wouldn't that stand to reason that, okay, well, because the judges test of how old she was was stupid it was like well you say she's 22 or however old and 
she stopped growing. People start usually growing at a certain age or stop growing at a certain age. So I declare her to be 22 years old. That's <laughs> literally what happened, right? So if that's the evidence that he was going off of, it means that he didn't have anything that would allow him to definitively make that determination. I just got to mm -hmm. imagine. I can't uh, picture a scenario in guardianship court, for example, or adoption court in California or um, family court in California or dependency court in California where a judge in that situation, if we're going to necessarily be stripping a minor of rights, where they wouldn't give that person some kind of representation because one of two outcomes, either she's an adult and it doesn't matter, she's still entitled to representation, or if she actually is a minor, she's specifically entitled to representation. I just don't understand. And I know we did a whole episode um, six months ago explaining why the appellate court shut the door on uh, the reaging thing. I just can't understand why that is not specifically an appealable issue, the fact that she didn't have representation. I do know mm -hmm. that that issue was raised I don't remember the, the legal analysis or reasoning. Even if I understood it back then, I don't understand it now. It makes no logical sense from an attorney's yeah. perspective. None. Due process is a thing. It's really important. And Natalia uh, didn't have any when it came to her getting reaged. Before I get too off track. Um, hey, Eliana, full, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, full authority to say, <laughs> hey, Omar, maybe you should move on before you go on your rants. <laughs> It's okay. I'm uh, I'm enjoying. So, all right. I'm not gonna stop you. So, um, let's talk about the DePauls. The DePauls seemed to be the perfect adoptive parents for Natalia. They had the same medical condition that she had. Um, they were very sympathetic and aware of what her medical needs were going to be. Um, she got along really well. She describes her relationship with the, the, the Paul's uh, biological daughter like they were best friends, like two peas in a pod. That's what they said. Mm -hmm. um, they attempted to adopt her back in 2009. And in their opinion, as far as Natalia's age, to us, she was a child. They thought that the Barnett should be in jail because of everything that they've learned post their attempt to adopt um, but they recalled an event where they had set up a private meeting at a museum. Her adoptive mother uh, brought her in, uh, the Chaconis. She came in. She was yeah. a cute kid. They had Mackenzie ready. Mackenzie was four years old. That's her bio their biological child. They were long-lost sisters. Uh, they had two subsequent visits. The children had bonded. There was pictures about of them in the, in the documentary. They looked adorable together, like doing each other's hair, like blow dryer mm -hmm. and big cheesy smile on everybody's faces. It just seemed like a perfect match. Um, and then after that last visit after Christmas, which would have been the third visit with the DePauls, things got really messy with the attorneys. <sighs> I really hate attorneys, Ileana. Um, <laughs> but it had nothing to do with Natalia. It says to them, it was heartbreaking. They said they had a very deep bond. Um, it was enduring. They loved her. They had no problems with her. They wanted her. It should have worked out. But then CPS in New Hampshire received a report regarding Natalia and the Chaconis. The Chaconis suspected that the DePauls filed the report, which is unfortunate because mm -hmm. there are cases that exist that if certain people come into the knowledge of certain facts, it requires they are mandated to report things that they see. And I don't know what the nature of the CPS report, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me that if the, if the DePauls were going to be adopting from the Chaconis that they would file the CPS report. Why? If she's going to come live with yeah. us anyway, what does it matter? But the Chaconis thought the DePauls had, were behind this CPS filing. And because of that, they said, oh, no, 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 not with the DePauls. And that was that. This is kind of how it ended. Um after they had this, this, this whole bonding experience and Natalia was, mm -hmm. and again, I keep going back to the psychology of Natalia. So she's with the Chaconis. Chaconis don't want her. She starts to fall in love with the DePauls and her daughter and thinking that there, she's going to go with them. And that's kind of swept mm -hmm. out from under her, uh, because, uh, the Chaconis had a temper tantrum because of their ego. What else would you call that? <laughs> um, I don't know. But so, 
there was actual text messages that were displayed in the documentary between Christine and Nicole DePaul. So after um, the DePauls don't get to adopt, they are giving word that the Barnetts were taking over. There was a text message between Christine and Nicole DePaul on March 6th of 2011 uh, that she's here now and we're trying to help her heal and love her. And that was it. Um, so, you know, heartbreaking for the DePauls. They really wanted her and all of that. And they get this text message of, oh, okay, I guess they're going with the Barnetts. But then one year later, mm -hmm. Ileana, March 29th, 2012, precisely a year later, she gets another text message from Christine. Hey, did you ever think that she may be older than you were told? And then, you know, the DePauls are like, WTF? No, because she's clearly a child. Um, and then she says, the DePauls, um, that it was, a, it was just a red flag about how they got her without ever meeting her. And that story checks out because mm -hmm. you recall, they go and they meet in this room and the Barnetts and the Chaconis are there and they take her and then they go to Disney World and then that was it. They hadn't spent any time with her. It was just, oh, we're mom and dad now. Um, but red flag, they just got ripped away from the DePauls. And so um, that was that, just, uh, you know, how different it could have been um, mm -hmm. for Natalia. I don't know. What do you think of all of that? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> there was just so much going on, like the whole, the whole CPS reporting thing. I found it so strange. It just didn't make sense um at all um and i don't know all, through all of this what i kept thinking is about natalia like she just keeps meeting all these people and she's getting her hopes up and then she ends up with the worst <laughs> the barnets uh, like yeah. i i don't know it's all right, so after all of that, um, we get to uh, the uh, story of Natalia's tooth coming out. And then, you know, I mean, not to rehash it, we kind of talked a lot about it, but it's basically, hey, I had a wiggly tooth and it came out and Christine was like, why did you pull out your tooth? Um, and, and Natalia's like, well, I didn't pull out my tooth. Um, and then Christine says, BS, yes, you did. And then this, uh, this whole thing. Um, I don't remember if she got pepper sprayed because of the tooth thing. I, I thought that the pepper spray no. was once there was two in instances. Once was, two. I want you to feel what, it, this is what it's like to, to be pepper sprayed. And then the second one was mm -hmm. she couldn't figure out high school level physics as a six year old. And she got pepper sprayed for that. So I don't think she was pepper sprayed that, for the tooth. Or that was an episode was two. That, Cause I remember also the, the incident with the, I guess Lysol and the coffee. Oh, that's coming later. That's in three and four. That's for next week. Oh, okay, okay. We'll talk about that. So um, <laughs> they go through this whole story, and that was fine. But here is the medical evidence. Uh, they talked to Tim Gosweiler, who was Natalia's dentist. He saw her in 2011, and um, he seems like a regular dentist, you know, a nice guy. He had no idea about any of this, by the way. Um, but he goes in, and Christine has these questions. Um, and she says... Um, she had questions about how old she was. And you're like, all right, well, that's kind of weird. Um, Christine asked her if there was, asked him if there was a way that he could find out how old Natalia actually was. Um, and then the guy was like, I mean, yeah, I guess, but, you know, weird request. Um, he remembers talking to Natalia. She looked like she was about seven years old, but she acted much older, um, could see how mom would think that. Uh, she seemed very mature. Um, Rachel Ambler, do you remember her? She was the neighbor, one of the neighbors in Tippecanoe. Oh, yes. Uh, she was the yes. lady with the orange face. She was like very obviously yes. uh, spray tanned and all. Um, she got ready for this production, I'll tell you that. Um, oh, yes, she but, did. <laughs> yeah, but she talked, Rachel Ambler talked about Christine had told her neighbor that the dentist said that none of her teeth were baby teeth. That's what Christine told Rachel. Hearsay, I don't know if she said that or not, but, you know, it speaks to the narrative that Christine is a liar. The dentist just showed us the x-rays and says, there is a definitive answer as to how old Natalia was in 2011. And he says that we determined that she had 12 baby teeth remaining, three in each quadrant. 
Very simple to determine her age. There is no question when you have baby teeth and adult teeth, there is a range for this level of tooth development. And it was between six and nine years old. This is indisputable. In his words, indisputable. Um, and Liana, before the show, you had mentioned uh, that your husband has baby teeth. A bunch of you in the comments had mentioned, oh yeah, I had my 44, my 45 year old son has baby teeth. And I didn't know that mm -hmm. that was a thing. But all of you said, oh, yeah, I still got like one or two left. But Big Natalia fight. had 12. Um, mm -hmm. Do you know, Eliana, if your husband, he has his baby tooth, does he still have an adult tooth under it? No, there's no adult tooth um, under it. That's why it never fell. All right. So in this x-ray, I'm not a dentist. I'm a doctor of law. My Juris doctor does not uh, make me qualify to, to know this or say this, but... It just seems if you got 12 and there's baby teeth uh, uh, on top of the adult teeth, it's unequivocal. But this dentist basically says that it's not deniable. She's between six and nine years old. If he believed the DNA analysis, the DNA put her at 22 years old as of recently, like a few months ago, as of uh, June of 23. Um, if she's two years older than what her, her, her birth date is, that's still within that range. So it all makes sense. Every medical test, every medical diagnosis is putting her within a three-year range where her DNA analysis jives with. And so, um, and again, none of this was presented at the reaging process, which is mind-boggling. Um, nobody performed discovery. Nobody, uh, I, I don't know. I have questions about that initial um, <laughs> petition. But so that's what, that's what he says. There was a doctor's note from May 31st of 2011 and this is what the doctor's note said. This was presented in the documentary. Um, it said, patient is adopted and mother is not sure of patient's age. Upon exam of patient, doctor determined the patient to be between eight and nine years of age. Patient is very well spoken and very mature. Uh, patient has um, her dwarfism disease and I'm not gonna try to pronounce. Um, doctor did not know uh, that her age, they talked about, uh, to him on the documentary. He didn't know that they raised her in, in 2012. It's like, they did? And how old did they make her? Like 22. It's like, huh. Yeah. Well, ain't that something? It was just like, wow, <laughs> the, the things that people do. Um, and then they cut to uh, true diagnostics. True diagnostics is, except, is uh, significant because uh, they um, play a very vital role in the land of life insurance when you develop these actuary tables, um, there are those tables that say that if you're 20 years old and you're uh, per such a percentage of risk of dying, if you're 50 years old, such and such a percentage, and they have very mm -hmm. measured ways on how to analyze DNA to determine the biological age of somebody. Why is that important? Because if you're 49 years old, but your biological age is closer to like 72, you're in poor health and you're at all these risk of mm -hmm. ailments and things. So they ran a full DNA um, analysis on her. Uh, they took a sample of blood. Um, and on August 14th of 2023, she gets the results and her age says her results said that she was closer to 22 years old, which is pretty close to what she thinks. She thinks in 23 mm -hmm. that she is 20 years old. If she was born in 1989, she would have been 34 years old. She's very clearly not 34. So somewhere yeah. between 20 to 22. Um, if you have a question of the Ukrainian birth certificates, um, I mean, you could question it, but there's still a reasonable three-year period where she's been definitively diagnosed as to be. It's somewhere between 20 to 22, and they've been giving that three-year age range consistently from the time uh, that she started seeing doctors. And so, to me, unequivocal what her actual age is. Um, the prosecutor's summation, she comes in and she says that Natalia came into the country in 2008 when she was four or five, adopted by the Barnetts in 2010 when she was seven. Natalia was eight when the age change petition was filed, and then she was placed in the Tippecanoe County apartment. In 2013, when she was placed in Lafayette, she would have been nine, a few months shy of turning 10. And um, that concluded episode one. I will say, and I think that this speaks more to the production, the, the production decisions when they were producing the show. 
Um, you heard the DePauls say, she's a little girl, she's not a car. And then you hear Natalia say, mm -hmm. it makes me mad because I pretty much sold like I'm some toy. And just like the way that they're mm -hmm. saying that, you know, the same ideas, that seems like it came straight from the production companies. Like they're putting stuff in their head, which is unfortunate because um, when people hear stuff like that, it just kind of takes away from the authenticity of it all. So I did talk about um, last week how I was very disappointed in the production decisions that were made in some of these episodes. Well, in all of them, but um, it doesn't take away from the unequivocal documents that it uh, perused over to make real determinations about her age and about certain other things. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for uh, listening to our summary of episode one. Um, if you haven't done so already, and if, if you're not already subscribed, um, we've also produced episode two. Um, so you're going to want to watch those back to back. And we have ep subsequent episodes coming out as we're going along in the coming weeks. But right now, one is out and two is out. So if you're done with this one, you're going to want to click right into that one. Uh, you're going to be able to get into it without missing a beat. We're going to see you guys, if you don't do that, next week. Bye-bye.